Dr. Palapsa is a distinguished member of technical staff at Wipro's Global Enterprise Architecture Consulting Group, where he heads the government and public sector practices. Dr. Saha is the chief architect to the Andhra Pradesh State Enterprise Architecture, e Pragati, and Bhutan e Governance Interoperability Framework. He work has cited by the United Nations, World Health Organization, US Department of Defense, Open Technology Foundation, Infotech Research Group, and, o and the Open Group, and has contributed to the World Bank EA guidelines for Mongolia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. Dr. Sahar. Thank you. Thank you. Am I audible at the back? Yeah. Usually I'm loud enough. All right. And uh, I must say, it's a very humbling experience for me to see how Eprakati has taken off. I mean, I still remember that day when we were sitting in a room and this used to be called Andhra Pradesh State Enterprise Architecture. That's the official name. But the, but the label Eprakati has become very famous. I suppose it is almost a phenomenon now. Right? Yeah, I'm very no, happy I, to... I think that's a Palo Saha name. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to hear that the state is going to announce 2017 as the year of e -progeny. so that is great. Uh, what is, what is uh, you know, very interesting as a result of e is that the awareness and the curiosity about enterprise architecture has grown. That's the reason we have more than 200 people here, and I'm sure uh, some of you may have heard about e already. Uh, there are a few, as he said, there are a few documents already available on the portal, but e is actually not about the portal or not about a system, because one of the common misconceptions about enterprise architecture is uh, when you build an enterprise scale application, people think that that's enterprise architecture. So for instance, if, if you have an ERP which touches every part of the enterprise, and the architecture of that ERP system becomes the enterprise architecture, and that's absolutely uh, wrong. You know, That's not what enterprise architecture is. Uh, between today and tomorrow, you are going to hear many case studies. Uh, I think uh, you know, Mr. J. S. had already walked you through what Eprakati is, and there's many more, uh, you know, information available about that case study. And later on, uh, I think tomorrow, second half, we'll have national case studies, and I've been involved, privileged to be involved in some of those uh, engagements. So when I was asked to speak on this, I was trying to figure out what should I be presenting because I've been involved in uh, national enterprise architecture initiatives in many countries, uh, directly doing the projects or also as advisor to you know, uh, multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the UN because some of these, uh, you know, some of the developing countries' efforts are funded by the multilateral agencies. So I thought let me kind of synthesize the findings that I have observed over the year and kind of present to you as to how the overall, uh, you know, the, the framework of national enterprise architecture actually plays out as the countries start adopting EA. Um, I think the, you know, previous presentation, we already spoke about what are the lessons learned. So, you know, it kind of takes up from that, you know, what are the lessons learned, what are the impediments that, uh, you know, organizations or I would say countries face in terms of doing national enterprise architecture. Uh, Alright, so these are some of the key questions that typically government leaders ask or should be asking. The whole idea of can we provide and deliver services in an efficient and integrated manner, right? That's important because services are how government interacts with people, right? And that's how it should be starting. It is not about building systems, building IT systems because I understand that most of us here do have an IT background in some way and that's not something that you need to be apologetic about. That's not, that's actually a strength because today every business is a technology business. So keeping that aside, uh, if you really see the way governments interact and uh, you know, converse with the people, with the citizens, basically it is through the services. So how can we deliver services in an efficient manner? The second question that the government leaders should be asking is how do we therefore uh, you know, direct our resources and investments to the right services. Uh, we were analyzing the 3,000 odd services. If there is actually a portal. Some of you may be, uh, you know, available, familiar with that. That uh, there is a portal called Ital. It actually gives a number of services provided by each state. It's amazing that if you go through the list of services, there are about 3,000 services. Now, if you're online, you can actually check it out there by state and different types of services. If you analyze the services, 60% are replicated, as Gaurav was alluding to. Every state is reinventing the wheel, right? And therefore, for a country like ours, we shouldn't be wasting resources, you know, coming up with the same kind of services. 
But this is not a technical problem. This is actually uh, more of a, you know, people trying to protect their turf, not this, not sharing information, you know, using confidentiality as an excuse to hold back information and all of that human factors that come into play when you're talking of enterprise architecture, especially at the national level. The third question is, do we have a common platform? I think, uh, you know, e property 4 is one example of a common platform and every state and even at the national level, we should be thinking of a common platform. We have not gotten to that point yet, but there are certain things that need to be taken into consideration uh, when you come up with a common platform. For instance, are we going to use open source as an example? So these are certain decisions we need to take into uh, consideration when you're coming with a common platform. And then a few other things, right? Uh, you know, one thing I get calls from many states and they actually tell me when you're speaking to the chief minister, he's basically talking about the, he said, 10x political will, right? Absolutely true. If you don't have the political will, the chief minister of the state doesn't have political will or if it doesn't come from the prime minister, this is not going to happen, period. It is as simple as that, right? You really, it is not about frameworks, it is not about reference architectures, it is not about notation, it is not about technology, it is all about uh, getting the right political will and that push is extremely important because the inertia of not doing it is very very high because we have been brought up in a situation where we need to be kind of almost by habit we think fragmented we never think holistic right earlier I mean in the, in the morning break somebody was telling me you know and this actually came up in our one of the national committee meetings that JSAC was mentioning about and you know we have colleagues from STQC here somebody said why can't two departments of the government actually coordinate so that the road digging does not happen after the new road is laid? Right? It's a you know general thing which is common across all cities. All because the different departments are not interacting, they are not thinking holistically. The road laying department decides that I need to lay the road, my work is done. I do, it doesn't matter to me if the telephone guy comes and starts digging the road because the telephone guy is thinking my job is to lay the road, lay the wire or whatever it is, or fix the wire. So this is this is something that is very uh, important from a from a government leadership perspective, which kind of uh, you know triggers the journey into uh, national enterprise architecture or code of government enterprise architecture. So this is a survey done by the World Bank. It shows you what citizens are expecting from e-government initiatives. India is listed there. Not all the countries are listed there, but if you see the top three priority from an India-centric perspective. What the, this is citizens' expectations. So what the citizens are saying is, hey, government, you need to plan for the long term. I think somebody also kind of mentioned that in the question, saying that when you come up with a national enterprise architecture, it should transcend multiple elections, so to speak. Right? What happens if a different political party comes into power? And this is a pragmatic problem that we need to tackle at, at the national level. The important point is, with respect to e-government, we need to have a national aspiration. right? Uh, I'll talk about a UN survey later on. The second important priority is, you know, from, from an India-centric perspective is citizens are telling you include us in the actual service design and delivery. You need to understand what services we need. Um, earlier he was speaking about certificates, for instance. Nearly 40% of government, certi government services are basically providing some certificates and licenses. It is not providing a service, providing a paper, piece of paper so that it can be deposited to another government department to deliver another service is not what government service is all about, right? But that is happening, that's quite rampant across the, and, and we have all been experiencing that, right? You apply for a passport, imagine the number of documents we need. Today, of course, things have improved, but it could be even better, right? So these are some of the uh, priorities, highlights from the survey, and there are a few other countries mentioned here. So I'll leave the slides here so you can actually have a look. You know, I'm not, the intent here is not to go through every bullet point there. Okay. I will not go into the definition of enterprise architecture. We have seen that. And uh, what are the different building blocks of EA? I think we have already been introduced to the concept of EA. What I'd like to highlight here are two layers or the two blocks here, security architecture. Given that a lot of the information is going online, having a common framework for security architecture is an imperative. Okay? I, I, I suppose we have a couple of people from the Ministry of Defense here. Future wars are not going to be physical war. They're going to be cyber wars. I think we all understand that. Right? If, if a terrorist brings down the Reserve Bank of India or the Bombay Stock Exchange, imagine the impact at the national level. 
Okay, so what I would suggest is that when we come up with a national framework, it's important that we give due importance to security architecture. And I think that is kind of uh, addressed in this conference because tomorrow we have a couple of sessions on security and cyber security. So that should be, uh, you know, uh, important part. Now, another thing why I would like to highlight the security architecture is today we are all talking about cloud, right? How many of you know that every global cloud provider, cloud service provider, is an American company? What does it do to the national security, uh, you know, context? Right? Ask yourself this question. It's not that I'm anti-America or anything, but I'm telling you these are the questions that people ask me. Where is that data going? Right? We all go gaga about all our office working on Office 365 and you know working on the cloud, but it actually could go to a single vendor, you know, and that's something that is actually happening, and people are not realizing it that this is happening. Right? Sending mails to Gmail, for instance, to government officials. That was the practice in many, many countries, right? So that is something that you need to keep in mind from a security perspective. I'm highlighting some of the things that actually come up, not just in India, but multiple countries. Okay. So what is government enterprise architecture? So it's a mission-focused approach and a framework to galvanize pan-government ecosystem, right? So that's the official definition that we have used for e property also by transcending boundaries for designing and delivering services in a coordinated, efficient, and equitable manner. That's very important because when you're dealing with governments, when you're dealing with government services, it's important that the citizens are impacted. In, in some sense, their quality of life improves, right? Now, what are we looking at? I think this has already been explained. So in one picture, I'll put it, this is what governments typically tend to be. They are very department or agency centric. But what we're trying to do is, get here. What you see here is from your current to the target. While we are not removing the departments, that would be too politically sensitive to do, right? We are not removing the departments. We are trying to figure out, can we come up with a common platform, a shared platform, which can integrate those different departments so that to the citizen, government appears as one. That is important. So the department administrative structure still continues to exist, but through these series of common uh, and shared services, when I'm talking of shared services, these are business services, these are government to citizen services, government to government services, and government to business services, you get to a point where the citizen gets a feeling that I'm talking to one enterprise, the government. And the whole idea is when the citizen approaches the government department, whether it's through a portal or through a physical office, maybe in the rural area, the government does not say, sir, you have come to the wrong department. There is no wrong door, right? Now that is very easy to say. Imagine, you know, the realization of it takes a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, uh, political will, lot of technology, and lot of process reengineering to achieve that. So this is basically, in a picture, in a nutshell, what e product is also trying to achieve. In fact, that was the whole essence of the state enterprise architecture. Okay, so I was talking about the UN survey. So this is the latest survey. I don't know how many of you actually follow this. UN does a survey every two years. So this is the 2016 survey. Okay, and this is publicly available document. And there it ranks all the countries in the world in terms of their e-government maturity. Okay, and India doesn't rank very high. I think it's somewhere around 106 or 107, which is nothing to be proud of. I think one of the goals of Digital India should be we should be ranked within top 20 in the next 10 years. Unless we have that national aspiration, it is not going to happen. Okay? Now, what you see here on the left of the picture are the different uh, you know, maturity levels as defined in this survey. So I'm not going to go into the details. But the whole idea is, can we move to a point where uh, you know, where different government entities actually interact with one another, so that's the intra-governmental, so the collaboration is happening within the government entities, to a point where you have intergovernmental, which means, let's say, two, two state governments are collaborating, right? Maybe it's a health issue or it's a criminal issue because criminals, you know, actually transcend different states, so can we have that? To a point where it is extra-governmental, which means that now the government is interacting with the private sector, Right, to provide certain services. It is not necessary that every service needs to be provided in full by the government agency themselves. Finally, to a point which is ubiquitous, right, which is where government becomes a platform. No country in the world has reached the ubiquitous, but at this point, if you Google it up, the country that is trying to get there is South Korea. 
which is actually seen as one of the pioneers of enterprise architecture. Right? And that's the reason this is more than digital government. This is digital economy. Digital government is only digitizing the government part of the country, of the nation, right? Digital economy is when, uh, when a private sector organization, for instance, encourages cashless payment. That is digital economy. And that's what countries are trying to achieve. Can we use digital government as a trigger to you know, build our digital economy? In the 21st century, that is how it is going to be. Right, so I'm not going to the details of the survey, but this is something that is very essential for us to for us to actually improve for for a country to improve its own you know, e-government mature. All right, so let me now walk you through. So some of these uh, pictures may be a little bit busy, but uh, I think uh, what I've done here is I've synthesized my findings to about five or six slides in terms of certain system models. So this technique was invented at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Right? This is called uh, systems thinking or system uh, dynamics. Right, And the whole idea is to understand how digital government through enterprise architecture plays out at the national level. Right, Because it's important for you to understand what are the enablers and what are the impediments you're likely to face should you, any country here or any organization, should embark on an enterprise architecture journey. So typically, now at this point, given the, the context is government, I'm focusing on the public sector. So typically what happens is the trigger for e-government or digital government starts with propensity to build a future government. Right? So basically if you see the vision 2029, the whole idea was can we have a long-term vision as to how the state should be directing, how the state should be moving towards a specific target. Now that leads to certain, and that is obviously a culmination of many factors. It could be economic factors, it could be demographic factors, social factors, digital technology making it available, so on and so forth. But eventually what happens is when you look at future government, it becomes very complex. I think the concept of complexity has been mentioned many times. I think you understand that. So it becomes very complex and citizens' expectations for governments are rising. I've shown you the slide earlier. That leads to use of technology in terms of transformation. That's the reason you saw in the previous presentation, e Pragati is a framework for transformation. It's not just automating the government. Now, why do we need uh, you know, tech-enabled transformation? Because at the citizen level, it affects corruption. And the reason I've highlighted the box there in yellow as corruption in our perception is because that is one of the factors taken into consideration by the UN survey. Did technology, adoption of technology in the government reduce corruption? Right? One thing that is very important from a digital government and digital economy perspective is that we, any country, you know, any country needs to start to consume technology. The reason why we are not ranked very high in the UN survey is why we have a very um, big IT service industry servicing, supplying technology to other countries. We as a country, let's say India as an example, we as a country are not very mature in consuming technology. Right? Yes, there have been few you know, impacts here and there, but as a country, we are not very really high in consuming technology, and that's precisely how digital government gets triggered. You know, the idea is from a citizen perspective, is it going to reduce corruption? Because one of the definition, one of the key points in the definition is equitable services. Alright, so that becomes the trigger, and you'll see some arrows there. Now, we've spoken about complexity, so there are a few ways to deal with complexity. First one is enterprise architecture, I think all of you have already talked about. Uh, Gaurav was earlier talking about role, roles because India has a multi-layered government and many large countries will have a multi-layered government, therefore it's important to understand what is the role of the central government, state government, urban lo you know, local bodies, panchayats and so on and so forth. Right? And then we need to have good metrics and incentives and that's why the whole idea of the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. Right? So it's, it has to impact citizen at the ground level so that his or her quality of life is improved. And obviously at this point it's important for any government, any country to understand what are the services, what are the overlaps and redundancies between the services, which is on your left there, bullet number one, so that the difficulties the citizens are having in terms of consuming those services are removed and therefore that leads to improvement in government performance. So this is not about building 
IT systems, yes, that's one of the key elements of uh, digital government or real government, but this is about improving government performance itself. And that's why uh, managing complexity is one of the key reasons why enterprise architecture is done. Okay? All right. Now, what happens is, let's assume that the country has already triggered some kind of a key government or a digital government journey. And as he rightly mentioned, the previous speaker rightly mentioned, for a country to adopt enterprise architecture, you have to get to a level of maturity of technology adoption. There are certain pain points you have to face to appreciate why enterprise architecture is required. Right? It is highly unlikely that an immature organization will actually need enterprise architecture because they will not be convinced as to what the benefits are. So that is extremely important. Now what happens is as a result of the trigger of uh, you know, the digital economy, one thing that happens is the ICT industry goes, uh, goes big. So the ICT industry which is on the lower end which actually becomes some way to uh, you know, ensure that the public sector and the private sector come together to uh, provide some of the architecture services. And that's one of the reasons why we are doing so many industry concentrative sessions, respect, let, let's say, within the context of e-property. So basically, it is taking the industry into the, you know, into the fold and saying that, guys, you know, this is all about, not about government alone, this is about the digital economy, and therefore the industry itself moves forward. So that's the second enabler, so to speak, in terms of digital government, which is at the bottom of the picture that you see here. Okay, now look at the services. This is global, nothing specific to uh, India. Look at the types of services that get impacted by digital technologies. So on your left are the services, the kind of the clusters of services that get automated first, and on your right are the ones that don't get automated, or they are automated last. Alright, so if you can see here, all the revenue generating activities, for instance, tax collection and all of that stuff gets automated first, which is obvious, right? But once the tax is collected, how that money is allocated to different schemes and social programs is something that gets automated last. So it gives you a flavor of how it happens. In fact, in e-government, uh, you know, body of knowledge, paying tax, if that is a service, paying tax is not even considered a service, it's actually an obligation to be, to be a citizen. The service is when the government comes and says, let's build the road here, okay, or let's provide internet services to the rural area. That's a service. An obligation is something that we as citizens, we have to fulfill as being part of the citizenry. Okay. Then what happens? So now it's playing out. See how it plays out. So the country has embarked, so to speak, on, the, on some kind of a digital government path. It has kind of brought in the industry, the, the ICT or the IT industry into the fold. But what happens is once you're starting to come up with common platforms and you know, uh, you know, shared services, typically what happens is there is a pressure to maintain autonomy. Remember that as Gaurav was alluding to earlier, when you look at it from a, from a holistic perspective, obviously there are a lot of redundancies. And remember these services are being delivered. I gave you the example of e right? If you actually go, you'll see that. Now if I come and say that, we did actually mention, you know, this has been mentioned, but when we started with 1200 services, 1200, what we bought was 745. So that the number of the other services were eliminated because they were redundant in some sense. Now, what typically happens is that once you start looking at it from a, from a holistic perspective, there is always an element of people trying to protect their jobs. And that creates friction within the system. That will become an impediment the way digital government is going to be adopted. So that's your loop here on this middle, right? So, and the second box, the yellow box, is the online service index. That is another metric that is used by the US e government service. So I'm highlighting the story through certain metrics that are taken into consideration. All right, and why this is important? As I mentioned earlier, in India we have, especially large countries, we have multi-level government. So we may have a national government, a state or a provincial government. We may have a district, a county is not here in India, but we may have a city government and even at the rural area. And what is likely to happen is that, typically which happens in India specifically, is that these governments can belong to different political parties who will not like to talk to each other. If that is not there, you can imagine why he mentioned 10x political 
Okay, so we are trying to connect the picture as to how it is going to play out when you come up with something like a full of government enterprise architecture. All right. Now, so I'm actually building the story. So now what we see here on the left, this side here, right? Once the digital services are coming on the portal, there is a chance that citizens are trying to consume those services. I mean, let's assume that the question that came up was, in addition to English, can we provide local language support? And let's assume that the answer is yes. So now, even in the rural area, the citizens are trying to consume services through the portal. So that improves e-participation. People, you know, citizens are now participating in the whole crux of digital government. And why is that box again? Because e-participation is the third factor that is into taken into consideration for the UN e-government survey. So other than the, here, the agendas here, I'm sure you can't read it, but the whole idea is other than maintaining their own, um, I would say, uh, you know, privacy in, in terms of whether my department is going to share information uh, to the other departments, other than that, all of the other arrows and loops, what you see here are positive loops. Typically what you see is those are the enablers. Those are the things that are going to push the adoption of digital governance. All right? Okay, now this is another survey, same type of survey. What it shows is satisfaction with online services. We are talking about the online service index, right? So what you see here is on your y-axis is how important the service is, right? Low to high, and on the x-axis is the satisfaction with the service. Again, on your seat top right here, the kind of services, filing tax assessments or submission, applying for or renewing a driver's license, applying for or renewing a passport and something like that. Right? So obviously people are generally satisfied with those kind of services because governments tend to spend a lot of money on automating those services. Because in general they are revenue generating as well. Whereas some of the more uh, subjective type of services, for instance here, lower left here, you can see there are a lot of bundle of services here where actually where the people are not very satisfied with the way government provides those services. So it gives you a sense of how services are being looked at from a citizen-centric perspective. Alright, now, now comes the story, right? We have all the plus points of digital government. Now what happens is, a lot of people think that enterprise architecture therefore is about centralization. Everybody must follow a specific standard. And once you start dictating that, there are people within the government entities who will try to maintain their own turf. So they will come up with their own empires, whether it's technology empire or business empire. The usual, uh, and the usual reason given is uh, the way you guys are doing is not how the way you work. You know, we would have to build our own thing because the whole idea is it's a not invented pure symbol. Okay, so if one state comes up with a reference architecture, the other state will say, no, this cannot work for me. I can tell you from my own experience, right? What is happening in EA? 70% of it can be replicated across any other state in India. At the business level, I'm not even talking about the technology level. At the technology level, standardization is very easy. You take it for granted, it will work. Okay, even at the business level, the kinds of services that different states provide are very, very similar. Yet you go to another state, they will say, no, this is very different. This is what AP has done. I'm not going to follow that for various reasons, right? And therefore, what happens is people start replicating. That becomes an impediment in the overall digital government at the national level. Okay, so that becomes an impediment. Now, so now all of the breaks are coming into play. Okay, now this is something that I'd li like to highlight here. Now enterprise architecture can be scoped out at different levels. You can do it at the national level or at the entire organization level. You can segment it out. So for instance, I might say, can I do an enterprise architecture for the entire health sector? Health sector across the country, maybe I can do it, right? Can I do an enterprise architecture for the transportation sector, as an example? Can I do it for the social empowerment sector? So that's the segment architecture, followed by solution architecture, something that we all understand quite well because that's where the solutions and the systems will come in. But the important point here is to maintain that hierarchy. Why? Because as I showed you one slide back, we have a multi-level government. Many countries, large countries have a multi-level government and therefore that needs to be integrated. Tomorrow, 
after AP is done with Heat Prakati and all of the systems are in place, the Department of Health can come and tell me, I want to build my own enterprise architecture as long as it is compliant within the overall Heat Prakati. Absolutely. You should be able to allow that. Right? Because Department of Health in its own right is an enterprise, right? They should be able to do it as long as they follow the overall principles and guidelines and standards that have been put in the statewide framework. So federated approach is something that tends to work well when you want to balance centralization with autonomy, right? Our constitution actually gives a lot of autonomy to the states, which means that for us to, and we have to respect that, right? And that's extremely important. It's not necessary that all of us have to follow a centralized model. And to maintain that autonomy, therefore, there needs to be some change in terms of the way we think. Some structural shift is required. Okay, now enterprise architecture is hard and something that is important is that therefore there has to be some embracing of federation. Which means that what federation means is that at the central level you define the methodology, you define the frameworks, you define the best practices, you define the guidelines and leave it at that. Don't get into the brass tacks of actually operationalizing. Give the states the autonomy to operationalize it. As long as you qualify, as long as you comply to the big picture, you're okay. <coughs> Because the whole idea is if you try to centralize and push everything to the central entity, it is not going to work. States are going to reject it. And we've seen that in case of demonetization also, right? At some point, certain states start opposing it. Whether it is you know, relevant or not, that's a different issue. But states do start opposing it at certain level, right? OK. Having said that, you have seen this in an uh, you know, context earlier. What it provides you, once you have a federated approach, is something called, very important in the architecture uh, domain, is called line of sight. You need vertical line of sight, you need horizontal line of sight, and you need lateral line of sight. All the three dimensions. Because it is possible that a person who is collecting ration, who is giving an example of ration, right? A person who is collecting ration probably belongs to the uh, you know, below poverty line category of the uh, you know group of citizens. Therefore, he also qualifies for free education for his kids. Okay, and maybe some free passes in railways and state bus corporations. So, what is happening is one service, one role can actually trigger multiple different sectors, and therefore that visibility needs to be maintained. And that can be maintained when you have a people hub, when you have land hub, when you have you know IoT hub, and so on and so forth. But the whole idea is to provide a 360 degree view from a citizen centric perspective because the citizen is approaching the government. That's all, and nothing more than that. All right, so I've spoken about the multi layer, so I'll not go into the details. So that's the same thing. So you have enterprise architecture, agency architecture, and the solution architecture. Three layers. Now, I'm seeing this playing out right here in India, right? Once AP is done and other states are approaching, they can be join the bandwagon. Of course, they don't use, saying, use the word bandwagon. The idea is, can we become the second or the third state to do a statewide enterprise architecture? That is good from a national perspective. Because you can have all the reference architectures, frameworks, and guidelines. What you also need is success stories. You know, imagine AP is a success story. After that, you have two other states who are also success stories. And you shared that success story with other states, the remaining 26 or 25 states. The critical mass is created. It's almost like a big wheel. The wheel starts rotating. But for that, you have to figure out who are those friends right, that you have in the organization who can actually support you in your mission. All right, And you create your allies and alliances. That's a plus point. So that's the model. So the, model, the slides are available already. In fact, I've given it to the, uh, you know, the team here. Now look at the top barriers for digital government. Nothing specific to India here, but this is global. The top most barrier is insufficient funding. OK? But let's assume that money is available. Look at the number two. Too many competing priorities. Somebody is doing Six Sigma, somebody is doing BPR, open source, cloud, big data, Hadoop, all of that jargon is coming, and suddenly nobody is thinking, let's look at it holistically. Somewhere it has to connect. 
right? And number three, as I said, security concerns. You can digitize whatever you like. In the end, it actually makes you more vulnerable if you don't tackle the security aspect. And that's the reason I was kind of emphasizing why security architecture is a, is a must for any enterprise architecture framework. Okay. So this is the full model. What you see here is once you have the full system model, it is at this point that countries and organizations start taking benefit of enterprise architecture. This is where the value comes in. Remember, on its own, enterprise architecture is of not any value. You can create all of the documents and all of the models and frameworks. What is important is whether it is adopted. Do you use enterprise architecture for decision making? Do you use enterprise architecture to identify where you should be putting your money? Do you use enterprise architecture to identify which are your high priority services? That's where the ROI comes. All right. So this is how it plays out. Now you must be wondering what is the value of having this model? Because you need to understand as from a strategic perspective when you're doing enterprise architecture for any large organization, government, you know, whole of government, even at the national level, you need to understand what are the enablers and what are the impediments. Right? So I've shown you these three yellow boxes. So those are the parameters that are taken into consideration in the UN e-government survey. So if you were to design an enterprise architecture framework, we have to understand that we need to do well in that survey. You know, as I said, we need to have an aspiration. Okay, so this is the entire model, right? The model is probably not readable, but the picture is actually very clear. It's the projector which is not projecting it very clear. Now what you do here is, therefore, from this model, you can identify what are the things to be done to push the adoption of enterprise architecture. I told you, right? Any journey, transformation journey, is a mix of enablers and inhibitors, impediments. Plus points, minus points. Your journey will be successful as long as the combined impact of enablers is more than the combined impact of impediments. It's as simple as that. No matter what you do, realistically, you cannot get rid of the inhibitors. What you can do at best is minimize their impact on the overall implementation. Even in AP, all of those in, you know, uh, inhibitors actually exist, impediments. So that was precisely what I was trying to come to. You will have to face all of these things if you were to do enterprise architecture. It's a mix, it's actually a journey. It's almost like, you know, it's a balance of things that will help you and balance of things that will stop you. Okay, so what you're, what you're seeing here is, through the synthesis of multiple case studies, there are certain interventions that are important for you to drive the adoption of enterprise architecture both at the state level and also at the national level. Okay. How do we use enterprise architecture? Four different ways. One way to use enterprise architecture is to support strategy. So you have the grand vision, vision 2029, and use enterprise architecture to realize that strategy. That's one way of using enterprise architecture. The other way is to use enterprise architecture to manage your portfolio. You heard 72 projects. So what you do is in multiple engagements that have been involved in, typically there are multiple initiatives that are derived out of your architecture. You can manage it as a portfolio. You know what portfolio is from a financial perspective. Right? You manage your portfolio so that you can manage your risk. Somebody had a question on risk, right? Every project is not equally risky. Some are more, some are less. Can you manage it from a portfolio perspective? Usually the whole idea of portfolio is financial, is economic. Third is you can use enterprise architecture to support your projects, individual projects, to support your vendors. And the fourth way of using enterprise architecture is to guide your solution delivery. I'm building a system, can I have common reusable services? Can I look into the directory and use those services and assemble my system instead of building it? So there are many ways architecture can be used. And this is important because if, if your blueprint is not being used in any part of the organization, then you're failing. Your blueprint may be a beautiful document, you saw the book here, it's right here. It has to be used, it has to be put to use, somebody has to use it. Alright, so there are various ways of using enterprise architecture, basically to highlight the fact that it needs to be adopted to get the ROI. 
Okay. So OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They have come up with three principles. Engage citizens and open up governments to maintain public trust. So trust and corruption, we have spoken about that. Adopt cohesive approaches to deliver value to governance, governments and strengthen government capability to ensure return on ICT investments. To put it all together into a single framework, this is what governments need from a digital government perspective. Having an architecture is important. Driving governance is equally important. That's your second layer. Then you have the different uh, segments of architecture, so to speak. So there's a performance part, there's a business part, there's an information application technology. But a lot of governments think that once they are done with the enterprise architecture, it's all done. They will succeed. That is not going to happen because there are many other supporting activities that need to be tackled. So for instance, governance of IT, service delivery, performance, IT risk management, security, we've spoken about security, assurance, investment management, open data. These are all the things that are important. So those third layer boxes are equally important. Then you have certain enablers. Procurement management, the way government procures information technology systems is equally important. Change management, project management, communication, so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to tell you here is on this slide, enterprise architecture no doubt is an important element, success factor, but there are many other things that need to be put in place to have a full digital government framework. Okay? People ask me, are we built the architecture, why don't we succeed? I said, we have not taken care of the other things, plus the impediments that we need to figure out. Okay. I think uh, this is the TOGAS one, I will not get into the details of it, but I think there is a methodology here which is very similar. So what we are doing is here, he was talking about e line effect, I will show you how the e line pictures go. So this is the light when well, it's light, right? But there are only five phases here on your left. So these are the five phases. Currently it's still work in progress, but I'm showing you what is currently work in progress. So on your left there are five phases. We've simplified it. Number one is direction and your strategy, your vision. That's your vision 20 to 29 as an example. And there are multiple steps of direction and vision, so that's what you see there. And the outcome of that is your architecture scope and vision. This is here box. So that's the milestone that you get from phase one. The second layer there is business architecture. The entire layer is the different steps of business architecture. I know I'll skip the steps, but the direction is once the strategy and the vision is set, you need to define what your business is in case of government it could be services for instance. Right? Even service prioritization, rationalization, you want to eliminate certain services, you want to re-engineer certain services, so on and so forth. So that's the second layer. And the output of that is target business architecture. That's your second <coughs> one on your right. The third is blueprint, which is where once you know the business, now you need to come up with the data, the application, the technology, and the security on it. Combine all of this together into one document called the architecture blueprint. That's your third box on the right. Having the blueprint is not enough. You need money, right? You saw the money. Every country needs money, right? So the fourth layer is investments. You have to identify those architecture initiatives and figure out what are you going to invest the money in. You know, you may have 72 projects, why don't we focus only on the four projects? There might be some thinking around that, right? You need to prioritize. That's your fourth layer. And the uh, idea here and the output from there is the roadmap. Now the government has come up with a roadmap, it needs to put in place procurement. Okay, vendors have to come in and probably build those, uh, you know, implement those initiatives. That's your fifth layer, and that's your outcome, which is your transformation outcome. That those are the five key outcomes that we're looking from an EA light perspective. That's all. How do we address every aspect of architecture? The first layer is why. Second layer is what. Third layer is how. Fourth layer is when and with what. Timeline and resources. And fifth layer is how well. That's it. Five <coughs> fundamental questions that are getting answered through the process. Okay? So this should be available sometime in April. I am assuming it may go to me. So that's the answer. Okay. So this
this is actually a maturity model. I'll skip the maturity part of it because no, actually no state has reached the phase five. You know, uh, most states are probably, even the most advanced state is probably at between phase three and four. Because the idea is not to get the blueprint, the idea is to use it for certain decision making. So that's where it is phase four and then phase five is taking benefit. Okay, so we are not yet uh, you know, anywhere close to phase one. And most states are actually in phase one, or before phase one is phase zero. Okay. All right. I think this is fine. Some benefits. Right. So I also did a survey. We did a survey in collaboration with the UN. I'm going to show you some data here. So there are certain countries listed there. Right. And there are certain parameters, uh, criteria of enterprise architecture. You can see how the countries actually rank up. And I was talking about South Korea. Right? See South Korea here. Many of the things, in fact, of the of the seven in four, they are completely institutionalized. It means they have reached phase five of the maturity. Okay, certain other countries, uh, you, know, you know, Australia, Jordan, New Zealand, you know, so Australia and New Zealand are quite okay because you see New Zealand has actually reached institutionalized in two areas, three, and localized. Localized means they could have a mature enterprise architecture, but that's not government by maybe for one department, as an example. Right? So that's localized. Okay, but it gives you an idea of what is happening across the world in terms of enterprise architecture adoption. Okay, and the reason why I'm showing you this is some of, in fact, all of these countries, some of the major countries like uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, they rank very high in the UN survey. So there is a reason, there is a direct impact. If you have, if a country has adopted enterprise architecture, it directly contributes to the maturity of the e government. Okay. I think the findings are more or less uh, quite clear by now. There is limited awareness. Most countries, most states don't know what enterprise architecture is, so that has been built up. Governance becomes the biggest issue because you know every department, every ministry is trying to protect its stuff. There is no sharing of information. I think some of that you may have faced it. Uh, there is there is no concept of integrated approaches. As I said, we kind of think fragmented, maybe it's cultural or whatever it is, right? Uh, lack of uh, connection to national priorities, right? Nothing specific to any country, but the whole idea is we need to link it to certain goals which are more visionary in that sense, right? So that's important. Uh, most ICT funding is actually very agency-centric. And in many cases, especially in India, what I've seen is it's very rendered driven ICT funding is very rendered driven right? CIOs are not a common position in the government. There's no concept of a government CIO. Okay, who continues for five years? Let me qualify that. Okay, so I hope you know what that means because from a digital media perspective, it's important that we have that there. And then, of course, uh, one thing that happens is given that it becomes very IT centric, it does not get the amount of visibility. Uh, when, when I say it, I mean enterprise architecture does not get the amount of visibility and attention it requires. Right? For me, the best place to talk about enterprise architecture would, would be with the planning commission, with the EIO. Because you have the five year plan, somebody has to implement it, no? That's where enterprise architecture comes in. So that's the execution of the strategy. So that's the strategy for the country, you have five year plans, and then you have the, uh, the execution of it. So it's important that it, it, and certain countries have achieved that. One of the reasons why South Korea is successful is because it is driven by their Department of Government Administration. Okay, okay. I think uh, I'm more or less done. So this is something that I've already covered. I would like to finish my session. This is my last slide with one thing that you have to remember, especially in the government sector. 